The Lord be with you. Welcome to worship here at First Presbyterian Church on June the 6th, 2021. It's a delight to see everyone in worship. Um, it was great to see people both at the early service and during congregational meeting in here. And I have the pleasure now of seeing what the, the, the bottom part of people's, many people's faces are. Um, as we have previously shared, we are respectful um, of those who choose to wear a mask for whatever reason, and there may be occasions where you may see me in certain contexts here at the church wearing my mask, depending on what's going on. So we are thankful um, that more and more people have been able to be vaccinated and receive vaccination for COVID-19, and we give thanks to God for the decline of cases of the COVID-19 disease in our area, and we remain in prayer for many places and communities in the world for whom this is um, not finished. We give thanks to God to be able to worship here in this place, and we are blessed with uh, additional people this morning, um, different people participating as worship leaders. We are blessed to have Nancy Miller here as our pianist, all the way from down the street, a missionary from, from Wesley United Methodist. Thank you for being here. And for Laura Knight, um, we're thankful for Ben for lining up some outstanding people to come and to sing and add to our worship. So thank you for being here. And John Bucklew will be our hymn leader this morning. Um, we will have hymn leaders to assist the congregation at least for June. Um, because we want to sing the best to our ability, and it helps to have a leader. And we give thanks for Bonnie, who's doing many different things today, um, representing the nominated committee of the congregational meeting, and she'll be representing the session later when it comes time to ordain and install Laura Higgins as our deacon. Um, only a couple of announcements in the bulletin to mention. Um, the Tuesday Women's Group continues to gather on Tuesday mornings at 10 a.m. We're gathering for a time of prayer and for different members to offer up a devotion for the morning. Um, the time for that gathering may be 30 minutes or 45 minutes or so. We recognize that people have different schedules in the summer, but we feel at this time that we still just wanted to to keep that placeholder in the calendar and have a time to reconnect and to uh, pray for one another. Also, there is an announcement about bone builders. Um, uh, they're gauging interest about restarting that group here at the church on Tuesday and Thursday mornings. If you're interested, please contact Marilyn Scott or Mary Lou Nichols. Um, we are thrilled today to have Bob and Judy with us in worship, and we remember uh, all of those who are worshiping with us either in person or virtually on this day. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us rise in body or spirit and turn our hearts and minds to the Lord and our service today by joining me in the call to worship that is printed in your bulletin. With God there is forgiveness, great power to freedom, redeem. Praise the Lord. Continue standing as we sing, We All Believe in One True God. We all 
believe in one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, ever present in our need, praised by all the heavenly hosts, by whose mighty power alone all is made and wrought and done. We all believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Mary's Son, who descended from his throne and for us salvation won. By whose cross and death are we rescued from sin's misery? We all confess the Holy Ghost, who from both for our proceeds, who upholds and comforts us in all trials, fears, and needs. Blessed and holy Trinity, praise forever be to Thee. Please be seated. Jesus declares that those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, Christ calls not the righteous, but sinners. Disciples of Jesus, let us confess our sins before God. Merciful God, your love for us is undivided, but we confess that we have been unfaithful in our devotion to you. Our affections go stray to false gods of money and power. Our commitments fracture among the demands of work and family. Our loyalties spread across the obligations of social class and nation. Forgive us, we pray. Reconcile our wandering hearts and restore us to faithfulness. Ground us in your righteous covenant that we may know to whom we belong. Live as your committed partner and honor you as our gracious Lord. Amen. Let us now confess our individual and private sins before our Lord in these moments of silence. Amen. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. now and ever shall be world without end Amen Amen
Thanks so much for Laura Knight for being here. Many of our musicians at the praise service as well were doing triple and tri and trip, uh, double and triple duty this morning. So um, musicians uh, must be in short demand in this area. This first Sunday of June, the first uh, Sunday of our summer, the Bible, and for us to become familiar on how to find a book in the Bible and how to find the chapter and verse, those kinds of core Bible uh, skills. And um, one person who was a little bit older um, than me, Rhonda, she was the older sister of a friend, um, she always led the resuscitation of the Old Testament books every evening at our vacation Bible school. And it was kind of a lead up to our VBS program on Sunday night. And we admired her because we thought she was so smart. She always got the books, the Old Testament, in order, even the ones with very Hebrew names uh, that for us native uh, English speakers was hard to grasp at time. I've always wanted to do a sermon series on the Minor Prophets, so you are the lucky ones, right? And the reason is that um, as Christians, naturally, we tend to hear in worship and in Bible study and our personal devotion time, we focus on the Gospels or the letters of the New Testament with maybe some um, stories in, from the Old or uh, the Psalms may be important to us, uh, key parts of our lives, but we're not familiar with those names at the end of the book, the 12 Minor Prophets. So the goal is to kind of do a little bit of a church-wide VBS every, every Sunday by giving you a very brief summary, just a taste of what the book is about, and then focusing on a specific scripture. And the first thing I'd like to say is that the term minor doesn't mean unimportant. Um, it means um, minor, shorter, compared to some of the older, other prophetic books, trying to, to show and demonstrate to the people of Israel how they've been unfaithful to God. Um, then in the later part of Hosea, there's language about God being a parent and how Israel is God's child. There are numerous oracles starting in chapter 4. And throughout the book, there are certain themes that I would just like to quickly list here. There are key themes to Hosea. Probably the biggest one has to do with Israel's struggle with idolatry. And they were idolatrous and not focusing solely on worshiping the one God by practicing 
the worship of man-made idols, or human-made idols, I should say, um, and also by participating in the worship of Baal, who was one of several Canaanite gods. He was sometimes known um, as the Lord of Rain and Dew, and people would participate in worshiping uh, by engaging in sexual activity. The purpose was to encourage the fertility of the earth, if you will. And that was a common worship practice in the land of Canaan, and the Israelites got involved in that, which displeased God. Um, so that is a big theme throughout Hosea. There's also the corruption of political institutions, which eventually led to the demise of Israel and to them being overtaken by Assyria. Knowing God is an important theme in Hosea keeping ethical actions toward neighbors and community center compared to it, it placing one's energy on elaborate worship practices that um, drew attention to those in religious authority and holding on to that power. That God's never about that in, in the church or in, in, in the Hebrew scriptures either. Um, there are several indictments of Israel by God, and we will hear one of those indictments in just a moment. And then there is this theme about love and salvation of God, that despite God's righteous disapproval of Israel's sinful actions and the hurt and anger it brings about, God remains loving toward Israel. And that is a good word to us today. So today our attention will be focused on Hosea chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. I invite you to listen to the word of the Lord. <clears throat> Hear the word of the Lord, O people of Israel. For the Lord has an indictment against the inhabitants of the land. There is no faithfulness or loyalty and no knowledge of God in the land Swearing, lying, and murder, and stealing, and adultery break out. Bloodshed follows bloodshed. Therefore, the land mourns, and all who live in it languish. Together with the wild animals and the birds of the air, even the fish of the sea are perishing. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, among the many benefits of living in the city of Bryan is having one day a month on your calendar that is simply known as Big Trash Day. I have heard stories about how some of you will be awakened after midnight of the morning of your big trash day and you people discard and how we how well we do or do not take care of of the the world that God created good the Tuesday women's group recently finished a bible study that was about learning how about the lament tradition in scripture and we practiced writing laments and the theme one day was about how creation laments and so as an exercise um, I humorously cast this um, discussion starter um, uh, writing prompt, if you will. Let's take on the character of one of God's other creatures and how they view Big Trash Day. And so one person wrote from the perspective um, of a squirrel um, who gets upset at the human beings that are just maybe a little too persnickety about picking everything up out of their yard and not leaving the acorns, which are their food. And then there were birds who were complaining about the racket that all the heavy equipment makes and how they disrupt the, 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 the space of land, which is the best to get the worms to feed their children. You know, we are accustomed to understanding that although God called us to be stewards of 
creation in Genesis 1.26, we know that God's creation, some resources are renewable, but they take time, such as growing and, and harvesting trees appropriately. There are a lot of things that we use in, that um, will have effects not only in our lives and in the cost of, of removing debris among municipalities, but they can affect the children in their lives and their children in the future. So that's one aspect, maybe the one that we're most familiar with about creation mourning, about human beings' activity. But then there's this scripture from Hosea 4, which describes and helps us remember that we are interrelated with all aspects of God's creation. In Hosea, creation is capable of observing human behavior and mourning and languishing, not only because creation may be damaged, but creation mourns when we harm one another, human being against human being. The concept of creation mourning over human sin precedes the book of Hosea. In Genesis, the first murder is recorded, the taking of Abel's life by Cain. And after Abel was killed, the Lord came and searching for him and went to the brother and said, where is your brother Abel? And initially Cain denied it. Playing dumb, anyone who's had children in their lives who get trouble, sometimes they deflect and, and say that another person did something, or I know nothing about that disaster in the next room. Even though Cain is a grown man, he's trying to pull the same thing with God here. But God says, listen, your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground The ground had opened up its mouth to receive Abel's blood. And after that happened, the ground would no longer yield, have, have as something to keep us in proper relationship with our neighbors, something that is described and offered to us in the Ten Commandments. Old Testament scholar Bruce Birch teased out the seriousness of some of these violations. He explains that swearing is not just using the name of the one God in vain. It is using the name of God or of a pretend God to bring about misfortune to another human being. Lying goes beyond the important matter of telling the truth. Lying presented a special problem in maintaining the integrity of the legal system in which justice depends upon the commitment of truthful witness. Can you imagine the injustices that are uncorrected because someone does not give a truthful witness about something that happened? Murder, stealing, and committing adultery are the very same terms we read about in the Ten Commandments. And they are there to guide human beings and to prohibit community-breaking actions. Hosea ends the indictment with a description that there is bloodshed after bloodshed, implying that violence has become the norm in Israel. Eventually, the consequence of Israel's behavior and political alliances will be Israel losing its land to Assyria, just as Cain lost the land upon which he had once lived. This indictment that we read about from the Lord to the prophet Isaiah may sound familiar to us, because even though this was from the time period of the 8th century BCE, there are things that we see and hear about today. The perpetuation of misinformation and lying. Yes, that seems to have become the norm in recent years, has it not? So many of us have friends and family members or or people uh, we know about in other churches that have been split apart by the information shared in various conspiracy theories or information about the COVID-19 vaccine. 
There has been an uptick in the acts of domestic violence during the time of social isolation. There has been an increase in acts of mass violence. It's, it's, it's as if during the pandemic, people have had this pent-up aggression, and they are acting out right now in places such as uh, in shopping centers or in workplaces. And just as the land mourned over the death of Abel in Genesis, and just as creation grieved and languished among the creation that languished, the wild animals, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea in Isaiah, I would not be surprised if a prophet entered in the doors of the sanctuary today and said that there are aspects of creation in our city streets and rural landscapes today that are grieving over the situation in which we live. We have been taught that it is important to recognize our personal sin and corporate sin as well, because both interfere with the will of God for all of creation. We have, as a, one of my important aspects of traditional worship, this corporate prayer of confession. It was something that was brand new to me when I entered into the Presbyterian Church. But it's so important to remember that the salvation and redemption that God offers is much more than just personal salvation. It takes into account the opportunity that we have to confess our corporate sin so that the kingdom of God may become more evident here and now by living into the will of God today. If we don't take time to think about what God may be able to charge us with, and if we don't ask for confession and then work hard to create those situations, not only we, but those who follow us will suffer the consequences. One specific consequence that we have been hearing about this week, and maybe even in recent months, has been the idolatry of white supremacy. One specific instance of that is the long-ignored and suppressed sin known as the Tulsa Race Massacre that occurred on May 31, 1921. Because this week was its 100th anniversary, many news outlets and print media have had stories about this in which they've been able to interview the few remaining um, survivors, and they've also talked with succeeding generations about what they and their family lost in their community during those days. Unfortunately, it was just one of many massacres of blacks instigated by whites during that time period. White supremacy is a type of idol in which one group of people believe that they are more preferred and more pure and more of the people of God than the other. It results in the coveting of possessions and social status attained by the hard work of people of color. It often asks, uh, acts as kind of um, um, a, a shroud disguising the insecurities and the fear of scarcity of one person and blaming it on the other. 100 years ago, a man named Richard Rowland encountered a 17-year-old woman named Sarah Page in an elevator in Tulsa, Oklahoma. No one knows exactly what happened, but Rowland was allegedly assaulted Page and was arrested. And a local newspaper, knowing about that arrest, the Tulsa Tribune, printed a headline that instigated violence the next day. The headline read, Nab Negro for attacking girl in an elevator. And a white mob did. 
the local sheriff deputized white men, black veterans of World War I, fearing what may, would probably happen, went to offer protection of Roland, but they were far fewer in number than of the white mob. As a result of the violence, the Greenwood neighborhood, once consisting of dozens of blocks that had been nicknamed Black Wall Street due to the numerous and prosperous black-owned businesses and their homes were looted and destroyed. 300 citizens died and 500, five, excuse me, 5,000 people became homeless. As devastating as that event was, you would think it would be something that we would have heard about as we learned history in our lifetime, but we did not because that story and others like it had been suppressed. To hear and to know that we in this nation are capable of such diseased perceptions of one another when we worship and idolize anything other than the one true God and other philosophies can leave so many of us dumbfounded. Thankfully, there are a few stories that give us hope. During the time of the riots, there were two churches that were noted, two white churches that were noted to helping their black neighbors. Uh, this was mentioned in a news story this week from the Presbyterian Mission Agency is one of their news stories. The Holy Family Cathedral, the Roman Catholic Church, offered aid, and so did Dr. Charles William Kerr, the pastor of First Presbyterian Church in Tulsa. Currently, in the Presbyterian Church USA, there has been a call for congregations and presbyteries and synods to learn more about racism in our country to recognize what it is and to consider what it is people are saying when they're calling for a need to dismantle systemic racism. Unfortunately, there are some places where there are efforts underway to prevent the learning about critical race theory in schools. We are called to give voice to the voiceless and to not participate in the things that cause our fellow human beings harm. We are called to take care of one another in all aspects of God's creation. Without doing so, without addressing the sins of the past and the present, we are in danger of those that live in this country of destroying the land in which we live and the possibility of future relationships. As Christians, we live on the other side of Hosea. And we know from the testimony of the New Testament that we are praying and we know that one day the kingdom of God will come down from heaven and heaven and earth will be renewed and restored Creation will be redeemed from humanity's misuse and destruction, and peace will rule. Let us find comfort in that, and let us pray the words that nearly close the book of Revelation that says, Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus, so that we will not lose the way that we were meant to follow. Come, Lord Jesus and prevent us from worshiping anything other than you and the Father and the Holy Spirit. Amen. One aspect of the, the, this particular faith tradition, the Presbyterian Church USA, um, that resonated with me, it resonated with me years ago when I found myself in it, is that it is willing to wrestle with contemporary issues. And people are able to gather together and to share what they understand and ask questions about what they do not. It's that kind of faith community. 
So if anyone out there is looking for a Christian community that is a worshiping community, but also one that is active out in the world, serving the the immediate needs of neighbors, and also giving thought to how we may be engaged in the big picture, please let me or any of the session members know. In the book of Hebrews, we are encouraged to do good because such sacrifices are pleasing to the Lord. Let us always remember to offer up our lives and all of our gifts back to God and to be engaged in the kingdom of God work. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. I would like to invite um, Bonnie Spurgeon to come forward. Bonnie is representing the session this morning. I'd like to invite Laurie Higgins to come forward where we'll now begin a service of ordination and installation of Laura as a new deacon. First, I apologize that we do not have you mic'd. Uh, we can move over a little bit, but could you share with us? Many people here know you, but perhaps there are some who don't. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your family and the way in which you are involved already in this congregation. Okay. Um, my name is Laura Higgins, and my husband, Matt, and my daughter, Aubrey, are here today with me. And I've been involved in the Tuesday morning Bible group with the women for a couple years and I've been in a choir before, and bells, and I'm, recently I've helped with crew, and I just am blessed to have this opportunity to, to be a deacon. Thank you. And Laura is also a member, a hardworking member of the Pastor Nominating Committee. And we're speaking about God's creation today. Laura has a gift of nourishing and growing things from the earth. So thank you for offering that gift in God's world. I'd like to draw your attention to the bulletin. Um, There are places in which the congregation will respond. There are a variety of gifts, but it is the same Spirit who gives them. God works through each person in a unique way but it is God's purpose that is accomplished. Together, we are the body of Christ and individually members of it. We are called into the church of Jesus Christ by baptism and marked as Christ's own by the Holy Spirit. This is our common calling to be disciples of Jesus Christ and servants of our servant Lord. Within the community of the church, some are called to particular service, such as deacons or ruling elders or ministers of word and sacrament. Ordination is Christ's gift to the church, assuring that his ministry continues among us. Through ordination, God provides for acts of care and compassion in the world, for the ordering and governance of the church and for the preaching of the word and celebration of the sacraments. Representing the only holy Catholic church and the apostolic church, the session of First Presbyterian Church of Brine ordains Laura Higgins as a deacon and installs her to active service in the congregation. Thank you. 
As God calls some to particular forms of ministry, God calls us all to bear gladly the yoke of Christ given in the covenant of baptism. Let us all there reaffirm our baptismal vows, renouncing all that God opposes and everything that opposes God's rule, and let us affirm the faith of the Holy Catholic Church. Congregation and Laura, do you trust, do you turn, excuse me, trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn away from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world, do you? I do. Do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior, trusting in his grace and love? I do. Will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? I will with God's help. With the whole church, then, let us confess our faith using the words the Apostles' Creed. Christian, what is it that you believe? I believe in God the Father. Grace of this church for a new service and ministry in Jesus' name. In accordance with the Constitution of the Presbyterian Church, USA, will you show your commitment to this calling by responding to these questions? Do you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, your Savior, acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? I do. Do you accept the scriptures, the Old and New Testaments, to be by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ and the church universal and God's word to you. I do. do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable expositions of what scripture leads us to believe and do? And will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? Will you fulfill your ministry in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture and be continually guided by our confessions? Will you be governed by our church's polity and will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? Will you, in your own life, seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? I will. Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? I do. Will you pray for and seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? And now the specific question for those serving as deacon. Will you be a faithful deacon teaching charity, urging concern, and directing the people's help to the friendless and those in need? And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? I will. Do we the members of the church accept Laura as a deacon chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ. We do. Do we agree to pray for them, to encourage them, to respect their decisions, and to follow as they guide us serving Jesus Christ who alone is head of the church? Ordinarily, this be when we would lay hands on those being ordained, but we're still living in COVID times. Is it okay if I put my hand on your shoulder? Okay, I wanted to ask before I did. How about Bonnie? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Let us pray. Gracious and eternal God, with joy we give you thanks and praise. 
Throughout the ages and in every place, you have chosen servants from among your people to point the way to salvation by your grace. We are grateful for ancestors in the faith who followed without fear, placing their trust in you alone. For the judges and monarchs who rule in righteousness and peace, for prophets and apostles who spoke your words boldly, words full of mercy and truth, and for leaders and teachers in every age who have nurtured your people in faith and faithfulness. Above all, we praise you for Jesus Christ who came not to be served but to serve and to give his life to set others free. Anointed by your Holy Spirit, he proclaimed your reign on earth, revealing your saving love in all he said and did. Gracious God, we now pray that you will pour out your spirit upon Laura, whom you have called by baptism as your own, and grant her the same mind that was in Christ Jesus. By the gifts of your Holy Spirit, empower her to build up the church, to strengthen the common life of your people, and to lead with compassion and vision. In the walk of faith and for the work of ministry, give to all of your servants gladness and strength, discipline and hope, humility, humor, and courage, and an abiding sense of your presence. Gracious God, pour out your spirit of power and truth upon the whole church that we may be for you a holy people baptized to serve you in the world. Sustain your church and ministry. Ground us in the gospel. Secure our hope in Christ. Strengthen our service to the outcast and increase our love for one another. Show us the transforming power of your grace in our life together that we may be effective servants of the gospel, offering a compelling witness in the world to the good news of Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Laura, you have now been ordained and installed to the active ministry of service here at First Presbyterian Church as a deacon. Be faithful and true in your ministry so that your whole life will bear witness to the crucified and risen Christ. Amen. Thank you. And I have, we have certificates for you on behalf of the congregation. First, your certificate of ordination and your certificate of installation into the class of 2022 on the Board of Deacons. And uh, just a reminder, our first deacons meeting with you is tomorrow night. <laughs> thank you so much. Blessings to you. And thank you, Bonnie, for representing this session. We will now move to the Lord's table. It's the first Sunday of the month, and that is when this congregation gathers at the traditional service at the table. And just as a reminder, this is the Lord's table. It's offer to anyone who wishes to partake of it. On the evening in which Jesus was going to be betrayed, he was dining with his disciples. It was the Passover meal. And he took bread, blessed, and then broke it. He said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant sealed by my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Each time you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Friends, this is the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. And this is the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Let us partake.
Let us pray. We give you thanks, O oh God, for all that we have partaken today in worship service. We are blessed to know you and to have been taught about you, how you are our creator, redeemer, and sustainer. We thank you for the word of Hosea that reminds us that you take not only our worship of you seriously, but also how we treat one another and how we affect one another through our decisions. We give you thanks for initiating a covenant with your people, a covenant that extends to us today through what you accomplished through Christ. We thank you for the prophetic words of the past and the prophetic words of today that remind us of, of your standard. Help us to live into being your standard bearers. We give you thanks for the Holy Spirit. We pray that it will make much of these gifts of bread and wine so that it nourishes spiritually and prepares us for what you wish for us to experience today and in the near future. May it empower us to have the courage to deal with um, long-standing problems that are more comfortable to ignore. We know that sometimes you call us to easy things and sometimes to situations that are more complicated. Empower us to take on the things that are complicated but need addressing. We give you thanks for how you have gifted people in the church. We thank you for the gift of those who've led worship this morning. We give you thanks for showing and calling Laura to serve as a new deacon here in this place. May you continue to extend our table and the work of this place so that we may be in partnership with other Christians and bringing about your reign and showing the kingdom of God here on earth. Amen. Of captives freed, of sight regain the end of greed. The press shall be the first to see the year of God's own jubilee. Live into hope, the blind shall see with insight and with clarity. Removing shades of pride and fear, a vision of our God brought near. Live into hope of liberty, the right to speak, the right to be, the right to have one's daily bread, to hear God's word and thus be fed. Live into hope of captives freed, from chains of fear or want or greed, but now proclaims our full release to faith and hope and joy and peace. <clears throat> In peace to love and to serve the Lord, but go out being willing to be challenged by what the Holy Spirit points out for us to address out in the world. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you today and remain with you forever. Amen. Blessed be the tide that binds our hearts in Christian love. 
the fellowship of kindred minds is like to that above.